Wow, what a great pleasure to be here. I think my microphone is working. Everybody can hear me? Great, fantastic. Well, thanks for coming. Delighted to be here, and I've got a lot of thanks. I know that some of the uh, people I'm about to thank have already been mentioned, but I'd like to do it again. So thank you, first of all, uh, Jessica Munich Ganger, Nicholas Lampert, Ryan Mandel, Christine Woywood, Kim Kozier and Yagvania, Yavgania, sorry, uh, Kaganovic, I should know that, uh, how to pronounce that. I'm an Eastern European name <laughs> myself. So uh, thanks so much for coming and for having me here. So uh, the intersections of art, science, and technology have been central to my own interests and my own art practice for uh, over 10 years now, uh, especially with regard to the more humanistic encounters with the life sciences. And I'm particularly fascinated with the ways in which culture and institutional structures shape our knowledge and understanding of history, science, and the natural world. With a focus on scientific visualization and also methods of collecting, documenting, and exhibiting images and artifacts of science, I try to explore how interpretation fluctuates between fact and speculation sensing and knowing, and order and affect. And probably if some of you out there have similar interests, you probably know that at present there is a growing interest in scientific visualization and imaging within the arts community. The representation and reinterpretation of scientific images has the capacity to expand our interpretation of these within a broader cultural context while also employing, of course, the aesthetic lens. And if this is an area that interests you, I would suggest you look at a great book by uh, Peter Gallison, Harvard University, and Caroline Jones at MIT. They co-authored a book called Picturing Science, Producing Art, and they talk about the, the, the coming together of the two as a kind of way of breaking down ontological barriers and um, creating this kind of trading zone between those two territories. And so today, in relation to this theme, I'd like to show you uh, some of my artworks that explore uh, the processes of the brain and some of its various associations related to cognition, uh, works that are inspired by bi biological forms in nature, and also works that focus on the relationship between human sensing and the environment. I'm going to start by showing you uh, a couple of slides that relate to um, several different initiatives that bring art, science, technology together. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce this Art Sci Fellows program, which was um, funded by our Scandalera Center for Entrepreneurship. And uh, the reason I'm showing you this at the beginning of my lecture is to give you a sense of the different ways that artists and scientists and people who are interested in technology tend to come together uh, in research institutions. It's very unusual for an ArtSci Fellows group to be funded by a Center for Entrepreneurship, but I did manage to convince um, the people there that um, bringing uh, people from diverse disciplines together to have conversations was a way of injecting a kind of risk capital into the academy and was in and of itself an entrepreneurial project. And they agreed completely and funded uh, this program with 17 artists, scientists, and people from across campus, uh, people from the humanities as well, to come together to talk about their research. So um, for anybody who's looking for a good kind of structure uh, to bring these kinds of people together or to, to enhance transdisciplinary conversation, this might be one way that you could do it. Um, from that particular grant, I managed to set up an MOU or a Memorandum of Understanding with UCLA. And we were able to co-host a symposium at UCLA in their California Nanosystems Institute last fall, where fellows from both UCLA and from my program came together to share their research. And the symposium that we, uh, that we put together was on art and the brain. And the third way that artists, scientists, and people t in technology tend to come together is through special projects. This is one special project called Sleuthing the Mind that was an exhibition at the Pratt Manhattan Gallery last fall curated by uh, New York uh, artist and educator uh, Ellen Levy. So this is kind of a funny 
image to start a lecture with, but um, maybe I'll show you this. This is a good picture to start with. This is um, an image called um, isomorphic extension. Uh, these are six foot uh, tall light box pieces and they were in this exhibition called uh, Sleuthing the Mind and um, the thematic uh, kind of overview of that exhibition was that the show was meant to be a kind of experiment that analyzes how both new and traditional media could induce new experiments by directing our attention, our emotion, and our memory. The exhibition asked viewers to explore how art focused on the body and how this could impact systems on the brain while technology and staging could bring adjustments to the body and our spatial positioning uh, and conscious recognition. So this is um, it's quite a uh, 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 kind of potent uh, curatorial statement for this show, but it brought together some pretty incredible pieces. And uh, so this, um, the, the piece that I just showed you with the two legs, this is um, inspired in part by um, somatotopic maps of the brain, and that's what you're looking at here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but these legs are from the archive, and in the archive I mine a vast inventory of anatomical models and prosthetic devices that were collected for the historical value. Um, very, very intrigued by the human desire to um, anthropomorphize objects and also fetishize objects that are used to supplement or probe the human body. And through these works, I attempt to draw together both the historical and modern desire uh, to really manipulate our corporal selves. And um, I was a um, Francis C. Wood Fellow at the College of Physicians in Philadelphia a few years ago, and that was when I had the opportunity to work with these collections of prosthetic devices, uh, gynecological instruments, uh, images of uh, flap anatomies, but I was particularly interested in the collections that, uh, that augmented the human form. In fact, actually prosthetic, uh, the, 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 our knowledge of prosthetics goes all the way back to the um, fifth Egyptian dynasty, uh, 2750 BC, uh, archaeologists unearthed the oldest known splint from that period, and um, in fact Herodotus wrote uh, of a prisoner who escaped from his chains by cutting off his own foot, which he later replaced with a wooden substitute. So we know that prosthetics have existed for, for many, many years. Um, but we know that the brain constructs an image of the body and that perceptual, uh, there's a kind of perceptual um, phenomena called the phantom limb uh, phenomena for people who have, um, who in fact have lost a limb. Uh, almost without exception, um, amputees will experience the phenomena of this, this phantom limb syndrome. And it's this vivid impression that there's pain or um, sensation in the missing limb. And remarkably, MRIs are able to visualize changes in the um, cortical topography and the sensory neurons of the brain uh, to research the brain's plastic uh, capabilities or the brain's uh, plastic qualities. So they know that there's something, um, there's something going on with the, um, the kind of reorganization of the brain um, when it's, when it's uh, attempting to rectify this, this missing limb. And um, uh, in fact, it's uh, Ramachandran and William uh, Hurstein that did a lot of research on the phantom limb. So this piece, in a way, uh, gives a nod to that research. And um, with the pieces located next to one another, if you stand at the appropriate viewing distance, which is about eight feet, um, the, the affect of that is that you begin to, to imagine the phantom body. So there's this really interesting kind of affect to these works. And, um, and so again, it's, it's, uh, if we look back at this image of the somatotopic uh, brain, you can see that the brain um, 
uh, governs certain body parts, and you can see on this diagram what body parts are associated with part of the brain, with, with which parts of the brain, with certain parts of the brain. And if you are missing a limb, all those all those uh, places get rearranged, or some of those places get rearranged. So if you get a your 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 arm amputated, it might be an entirely uh, your brain might actually be. Uh, um, governing some other part of your body, that the that the part the parts of those bodies will actually shift into that open space where you've got the missing limb, and the brain completely changes the way that it works. It rewires again. This is about the plastic qualities, but this piece is really about um, trying to create the affect of seeing the phantom body, and uh, they are they are not simply photographs. They are um, light box sculptures. So they, you, again, you get the right distance and you actually think you're looking at the real limbs in these two boxes. Um, this is another piece from that series and this is called um, Isomorphic uh, Extension. Um, speaking of biology and the brain, um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the scientific study of crime, which began in 1871 and uh, began with um, someone named Cesare Lombroso in 1871 in uh, Italy. He was a comparative physiognomist and a psychiatrist and also a prison doctor at an asylum for the criminally insane. And while performing an autopsy on a thief, he found an unusual indentation on the base of the subject's skull. And from this singular observation, he became the founding father of modern criminology. So Lombroso used calipers and craniometers such as the one that you see here to calculate the degree of relative so-called disproportion of the, um, the different areas of the skull and the resulting data was used to chart the relationship between the micro and the macro features of the face. And here you see a real subject being um, measured and of course it was often people of um, it becomes very uh, controversial because, of course, um, the people who are often subjected to these ex uh, experiments were, um, were not really in a position to say no. So Lombroso's controver controversial work was based on the premise that the homo delinquens was a kind of biological mutation and that criminals were an evolutionary throwback. Uh, Lombroso created um, a kind of um, hierarchy based on the pseudoscientific um, phrenological theories about the shape and the size and the features of the skull and the head. And um, his theories were widely accepted in the 19th and 20th centuries in Europe. And there were some pretty horrific consequences to this. And um, by the way, in the 19th century, um, artists and scientists um, were considered to be working in contrasting spheres and, uh, in, and in absolute opposition to one another. So thinking about the ways that throughout the periods of history scientists came together and then came apart. Uh, during Lombroso's time, uh, artists and scientists were thought to be in very, very separate realms and artistic license held absolutely no place in scientific discovery. And as Baudelaire would argue that the ethos of science um, certainly did not, was not meant to um, contribute to the making of art. So, so just to give you a little bit of historical context uh, of, of, uh, of the time. So, you know, jump forward and you've got this very jolly fellow that I just recently met at uh, UCLA in the Brain Imaging Center. Uh, this is Dr. Cohen, who's um, a pretty renowned brain um, imaging specialist and uh, he's, he's showing off his MRI, which is apparently a very high resolution MRI. And uh, he uses these hydrocell geodesic sensor nets to image the brain. And here I am being imaged. This is my particular fitting. We did not, in fact, do an MRI of me on that day, but uh, during the symposium, but I'm supposed to go back and get imaged. I'm afraid of what he'll find, actually. Um, hopefully, he's not going to find what we see imaged on, on uh, this visualization here. Um, so there are very, various imaging techniques we know today, and um, some scientists have developed what they believe to be a compelling argument for the genetic or neurological components of criminal behavior today. And this is a very, very, very controversial area in science. And here we have two images of the prefrontal lobe, 
where conscience, remorse, and guilt are shown. And on the image to the left, you can see a lack of activity in the part of the brain, um, in the frontal, frontal part of the brain where, again, guilt, remorse, and uh, conscience are shown. And then the image on the right is what's considered to be the, the standard brain or the, uh, um, the, the normative group. Um, and again, this is very controversial because if one believes that uh, criminal activity or disposition to crime is biologically determined, then um, you know, critics of this theory um, basically say, well, you're pardoning the subject of any sense of wrongdoing. Um, you're basically saying it's not their fault what they do. And if you believe that it's socially determined, then um, this becomes deeply political. There are deeply political associations to that. So this is a very controversial area in science. So um, back to my work at the College of Physicians, I was looking at this um, collection uh, of, and producing a series of photographs of, um, of different skulls in a collection by a Viennese doctor named uh, Dr. Hurdle, who was, um, um, Look, again, he was he was he was look he was collecting skulls and and measuring them and trying to create um, um, a kind of archive based on the measures of the skull and and different personalities. Um, so I ended up photographing this collection of uh, skulls and their accompanying archive cards, and each skull has a post-mortem tattoo that has very, very minimal information put on the skull. It might have the person's name. It might simply um, have an inscription on where they're from. Um, but it's a, it's a very odd collection because, again, you begin to read very quickly into the social standing of the individuals who are represented in this collection. Um, and it really also speaks to the kind of reigning regimes of the, of the day. Um, so most of these people are criminal offenders. Some of them are suicides who are in this collection. And, um, and the reason why this collection, in my mind, still um, is a contemporary collection, even though it's, it's uh, several hundred years old, um, the conditions that put these skulls in the museum to begin with are still the conditions that are alive and well today, and that is our preoccupation with difference. So let's take a closer look. Here are two skulls, and one is of Francesca Secora, who was um, um, died of meningitis at the age of 19. She was a celebrated Viennese prostitute, as we see on the archive card. And the other person was a, uh, a pirate. And um, you can see that the archive cards themselves have been written over, information has been scratched out, and um, you can get a sense of, of how this kind of taxonomy was built. It was built in pieces. Uh, you could tell that during different historical times when new information was written in or old information was questioned, it made you really question what it is that was really known about these people at the time that they were acquired. Um, this was the skull of a Dutch suicide. Um, this piece, um, this collection really interests me. And so what I've decided to do is commission uh, a, ser a series of writers to write speculative biographies of people in this collection. Um, I'm working with other artists, I'm working with philosophers, I'm working with people from psychology, neuroscience, philosophy. I will also be hiring a spiritual medium to create a seance and maybe bring somebody back. But the idea being that a series of stories about these people will be um, performed. And um, one of my collaborators on this project is Buzz Spector. Uh, colleague and artist, and hopefully we can get the video to work. I've got um, an excerpt from, um, I think, the first minute of the Dutch suicide.
On September 15, 2014, a search for gray Dutch weather produced 67 results on Google. Persistent frontal suture provides 11,500 hits. There were no results for pain associated with persistent frontal suture, but take away the quotes and 3,910,000 results appear. In Acute and Chronic Pain Following Craniotomy, the journal article appearing as item three on the first page of this multitude, doctors Gray and Mata note that craniotomies are generally thought to be less painful than other operations, but this assumption has been challenged. During birth, the skull must bend in order for the head to emerge from the mother's womb. The condition of persistent frontal suture results from the incomplete fusing of the frontal bones during childhood. Imagine the skull's sutures as fault lines in the plate tectonics of the brain. The doctors who cut through the skull in search of relief for this brain or that, recognizing that assuaging one pain might instigate another. Okay. If you Google Patricia Olenek Vimeo, you'll be able to see the whole piece. So just in the interest of time, I'll move on. Uh, but this piece, um, you know, the archival data, factual errors, um, the writer's personal biases, and their conjectures will guide them as they engage in their own process of sort of history and identity reconstruction. So everyone will have a very different take on this, and it will live as a series of prints, a, an artist book, and also um, a series of performances, the likes of which you've just seen here. So I'll move on to my next project. Um, several years ago, I received a grant for developing a body of work that um, relates to visualizing sites of sensation. And uh, I was inspired very loosely by, um, um, well, by this print, but also um, by the fact that there was a time when microscopy was actually considered a miniature form of theater. And the discovery of these itty-bitty worlds under glass provided some curious onlookers with a new form of entertainment, or in this case, uh, this is a dreaded glimpse of monster soup. Um, this is a drop of water from the 19th century Thames River, and you can see that there's this microcosm living in a single drop of water, and, and um, she's less than amused, I think we can see. So, um, so I got this terrific grant to um, to learn how to use a scanning electron microscope. And um, began working with research scientists to scan um, different images. And for those of you who might not be aware of what a scanning electron uh, microscope is, it can uh, take an image um, and, and uh, blow it up to, up to 130,000 times the size of the specimen. And there's a, a um, a gold sputtered specimen that then has a tungsten filament gun, um, that, I'm sorry, has an electron beam that comes from a tungsten um, gun chamber that shoots the, this electron beam that's six millimeters in diameter over the surface of the specimen and it creates these 3D images that are really pretty stunning. Um, this is how the specimen is gold sputtered. There's a very um, um, there's a chamber charged with argon ions that uh, crash into a gold cathode and the specimen is covered with a very, very, very thin layer of gold. And if you get too much gold on there, it's called decorating the specimen. You could probably wear this um, cicada um, as jewelry if you were so inclined. But this is what the images look like. They're just spectacular. And so basically the SEM is a 3D microscope. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, so for this um, project, I was scanning um, microscopic images, and I was uh, at the same time taking trips to Japan and photographing images from these gardens called Kaiyu Shurui Gardens, which are uh, composed and constructed specifically for the purpose of heightening sensation. And I was combining these micro and macro images in these large 10-foot high prints. And some of that body of work was produced at Trillium Press, and this is my nod to my wonderful host here, to um, Jessica. Um, I wanted to show a little bit of the work that I had done at Trillium Press, the land of yes. Um, 
Trillium is, uh, is truly a, um, uh, an image maker, but a, a printmaker's playground. Um, these are some of the images that I uh, took being shot onto plates and then using um, a flatbed transfer press, uh, we printed um, images from the series, um, about 42 by 42. This is the printer, David Salgado. And the other prints were printed digitally. These, these images that you're looking at now are, are 10 feet high. And um, the installation was constructed specifically for the rotunda space at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, DC. Uh, the NAS is an institution dedicated to the contribution to and exchange of knowledge in the sciences. And um, my approach to this pro uh, project was one of, um, of this being a situated practice. And a situated practice is a mode of engagement um, where the artwork is inspired by the conceptual and physical contingencies of a particular space. Um, so I, it's a fancy way of saying that I produced the work with that space specifically in mind, both its, its kind of uh, physical, um, uh, kind of architectural presence, but also the, um, the function of the NAS itself. And these pieces are part of a series called the Synesthesia series. Now, synesthesia spelled with a C um, really refers to the relationship between consciousness and sensation. We understand ourselves in this world as entities in a three-dimensional space because of our ability to sense things. And so this, um, um, so the series is, is really based on that. And the, the piece is trying to focus on the fact that in a technology-mediated world, it's very hard to be back inside of our bodies or to be conscious of sensing or, uh, or of sensation at all, whether we're talking about our sensing our own bodies or sensing the environments that we're in. So this was really the idea that I started with in building out this body of work. And it includes a variety of specimens. Some of them are transgenic, some of them uh, are non-transgenic, some of them are human, some of them are animal. But these are all um, images that include histological samples of sites of sensation on the body. So there are, there's human, there are, uh, there's eyeball tissue, there's fly eye tissue, um, but all of the tissues relating to um, five senses, we know that there are a lot more than five, but I was really focusing on sight, smell, taste, touch, and sound for this body of work, and I was combining those, those uh, microscopic images with um, these uh, images taken from gardens to create these kind of fantastical spaces. And here are three more. So as I said, these were 10 feet high. They were put in frames and they were hung in the hallway leading up to the large rotunda at the National Academy of Sciences. But these images were also printed on silk. And I'll show you the, um, the installation um, in the rotunda area in one moment. And there was, a, there was a really strange, again, a really kind of uncanny, strange effect to this installation because um, you were confronted with these images, you couldn't quite place them, and your mind kind of struggled to, um, to figure out how to resize the, the frame of, of, of your own body uh, in a way. And um, Susan Stewart talks a lot about this in her book called um, On Longing. Um, uh, about the, the being confronted with these gargantuan forms that you can't quite place. And uh, these two pieces actually um, included my own um, retinal scans. Um, the one on the right is, is called the hairy eyeball as a, as a kind of trick. I don't know if you know that saying. I was born and raised in Canada, and to give someone the hairy eyeball was to sort of give them a nasty look. Or, um, uh, so there's a little bit of a joke inside the piece. And these are the 10-foot high prints that are printed on Chinese silk. And here you see them uh, hung from the ceiling that has the rotunda. And this is just to give you a sense of the human scale. So these prints are huge. And once they were gathered up in this giant sea anemone kind of formation, um, uh, they would move with the various air currents in the building. And it was really quite, a, quite an imposing structure 
quite uh, difficult to install as well, but there it is. There is a soundtrack to this. Uh, I was interested in creating spatialized sound in this room, so there were numerous speakers and several soundtracks that you would trigger through sensors as you moved around the rotunda space. And this really needs to be heard with a good set of headphones. This is also um, on YouTube. So if you just Google my name and you Google National, National Academy of Sciences or the title of the piece, which is Sensing Terrains, you can hear uh, the soundscape. And uh, that was a um, uh, collaboration with Catherine Stein and Yuka Nirmala, um, a Finnish uh, sound designer. So, um, move a few years forward, and um, I was um, really inspired in my work doing a lot of prints, doing a lot of photographs that looked at the repetitive arrangements and the, excuse me, geometric configurations imprinted in nature, which not only provided great source material for prints, but also for, um, you know, public artwork such as this one. And approximately 10 years ago, I was approached by the director of the Mathai Botanical Gardens in Michigan to design a large-scale destination garden. And the design spans a distance of almost 120 feet in length and over 100 feet in width and um, involved the efforts of a very large collaborative team which consisted of architects material engineers, landscape architects, and biologists. And I'm certainly, again, a fan of working collaboratively, so this is a really exciting uh, project. This is a model for the piece. And, um, and the pattern that you see was uh, based on the growth patterns of the angel wing begonia leaf. And from those growth patterns, I developed an ADA-approved design that would have been built out of um, stone tiles for both the matrix and for the unicursal pathway. So this is the overall design of the piece, and this is the unicursal pathway. So you can see on the right side of the screen where the pathway starts, and then it wends its way towards the center and then pushes, pushes you back out and brings you back toward, takes you out to the outside again, pulls you back in. And this is what a labyrinth does, is it, it makes you believe that you're getting very near the end of your journey and then it pulls you back away. Um, and a labyrinth is meant to be a meditative walk. It is not a maze. A maze can take you to false ends. The labyrinth is meant to be one universal pathway which takes you, to, um, takes you through a kind of meditative walk to a central space. Uh, in this case, the meditative walk is 1,919 linear feet, or approximately 639 yards. And um, now that would take a good at least 20 minutes to get you to center. So again, uh, the piece is meant to provide the person who's walking with a time-based experience and with fluctuating perspectives on their environment, uh, which rhythmically telescope, expand, and contract. And um, here's the, um, the design for the fountain in the middle, which had a, a reflecting pool. This is a perspective view of the design. And let's see if I can get... This is also a video, but it seems to be taking a bit of time for these to come up. I'm sorry, maybe because they're large files. No. It's there because we tested it. Where we go? Okay, it's like that mouse has to swim. All right. So this doesn't take you down one particular pathway. It just floats you over the surface and gives you a sense of what it would be like to be in the actual space. And my hope is that we'll be able to build this one day, but uh, you know, the thing about these kinds of projects is that the you know, materials over doubled in price over the course of one year. So the project at one point was a half a million dollar project and affordable. I think we had raised almost $350,000 for the project. And then uh, the prices all rose. So. Um, 
so things can change very quickly on these projects, but um, it might be that it lives on in some other form at a later date, let's hope. Okay, so as you can see, I've been working much larger. My scale has been going up larger and larger and larger. And, um, and the next piece that I'd like to show you is, is really nicknamed uh, the Eureka piece. It's a series of vignettes that have been strung together, um, video vignettes, um, based on the speculation that everything that exists in nature is really one substance. And there, were, uh, there are a lot of different ways that one can look at that idea. Uh, it was discussed uh, by 17th century rationalist philosopher Spinoza, although um, his belief was that God was implanted in every single aspect of that matter. I wasn't really going there with the work, but this idea that absolutely everything found in the universe being made of one matter really, really fascinated me. I um, conferred with uh, several um, astronomers when I was making this piece. And this piece is also inspired in part by Edgar Allan Poe's Eureka poem, which was an essay on the material and the spiritual universe. And it describes Poe's intuitive conception of nature, uh, I'm sorry, of the nature of the universe, and it surprisingly anticipates discoveries of the 20th century. So it was completely uh, dismissed in its time. It was thought of as being complete bunk. But I, I get a chuckle out of this work because here you have a non-scientist who has managed somehow to anticipate the discoveries of the 20th century, such as the discovery of modern cosmology's conception of black holes. But nobody knew that he had, had managed to do that until there was a contemporary reading of that work. And uh, as I say, the fact that he did not come from science uh, makes this a rather extraordinary piece that's worth revisiting. Um, so this piece was uh, put together with a terrific team um, led by Keith Davis at the Jordan Hall of Science at Notre Dame University. And what you're looking at is a digital video theater that's a 50-foot diameter theater, a dome. And these are images from that dome. These are images from the five vignettes produced for this piece. And Part of what I was playing with was the idea that there were messages embedded in nature, so it looks like this one is working. Now, you have to imagine this 50 feet in diameter. And as you can imagine, um, if you see something flying that fast, 50 feet in diameter, you, you're probably gonna need the air sickness bag. So everything that one produces for the computer in Adobe After Effects has to be uh, not only recalibrated for the dome, but it also has to be slowed down um, considerably. So this is really the universe telling us that there's biohazard. So these kind of particles of indeterminate size kind of coalesce, come together, and form different symbols. And, uh, and again, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, kind of, a, again, another sort of fantastical piece about the idea that there's a kind of intelligence in nature, if you will. Um, a more recent piece, and the last piece that I'm going to be showing you tonight is called Dark Skies. And Dark Skies uh, is, is a piece that gives nod to Paul Bacarita's work where um, he actually attached sensors to a um, um, sensors to the tongue, and um, the, the subject was blind. And there's a way of creating um, a system where there's a kind of replacement of the sensory system where one can actually move through a room or move through a space through this apparatus on the tongue. So it's a way in in which one can actually see the room, a form of seeing of the room uh, with the tongue. So I was really interested in this kind of mixing of sensations. And I was looking at that experiment and thinking, well, um, well, you'll see in a few minutes the form that this piece takes. But while I was looking at Paul Bacarita's work, I was also um, learning about the, um, the dark sky association. and. Um, the Dark Sky Association is focusing their attention on the existence of an overabundance of light pollution 
or what is called photopollution or luminous pollution or basically just an excessive amount of obtrusive artificial light. Now, this is what inspired me to begin making this work. Um, but in fact, the piece is really about what happens to our human consciousness when we can no longer observe the world that we live in. And I became very interested in, 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 uh, in what this does to us as humans when we look up into the sky, but we can't see, we can't see past the city light. So uh, for any of you who have visited or have at any time lived in New York City, you recognize this as Central Park. You can see the glow of the city and how the night sky is completely obliterated. Um, this is from the Dark Sky um, Association. Uh, and it shows the map over a 24-hour period and showing you where the major concentrations of light across the globe uh, are located. And um, you can see that there's kind of light clutter in certain major metropolitan areas, right? This is how much light pollution we've developed between 1950 and 2025. So in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that's the late 50s. Go across to the upper right, and that's the mid-70s. Go down to the bottom left, and you'll see 1997. And then um, what we project will be 2025 is in the bottom right. In 19 94, there was an earthquake uh, that knocked out the power in Los Angeles, and many anxious um, um, residents were calling local emergency centers to report that they were seeing this kind of strange, giant, silvery cloud in the sky, and what they were seeing for the first time was, in fact, the Milky Way. So, um, so there you have, again, uh, an, an image of a, a blackout on the left, and what the sky looks like on any ordinary evening. Um, so if anybody loves things that scurry the way I do, you might have had a Siberian dwarf hamster as a pet. Any nocturnal animal uh, is gonna have its health um, severely compromised if it doesn't get darkness. Um, so this is called circadian rhythms. Uh, it's basically the patterns of sleeping and feeding. You know, we follow the patterns of animals. And um, the um, brainwave activity and hormone production, cell regeneration, and all biological activities are impacted by lightness and darkness. And the human body, just like animal bodies, need darkness, absolute darkness. Uh, in fact, let me go back. Um, if you look at this map, and I'm, I'm not, I, um, I only have this as sort of secondhand information, but I, uh, I believe it came from the International Dark Sky Association, I can't quite remember, but patterns of higher incidence of cancer follow the patterns of light that you see on this map. So it's really quite extraordinary. Um, good sleep hygiene means a small dark room. Keep that in mind, right? Okay, so getting back to that idea of seeing with the tongue, um, this is one of my scanning electron micrographs of a um, taste bud. I began collaborating with an architect at Washington University in St. Louis, Sung Ho Kim, and we decided that we were going to create a kind of video screen to um, produce a lenticular wall or, a, or a, a dimensional wall that would allow for a kind of lenticular set of uh, projections. We started with the image of the taste bud. This is the uh, 3D data set that got built from that. And we were, again, g going by the original image and trying to figure out how we could distort it, what kind of surfaces we could build, and what would make sense for this being a, a kind of projection screen. Part of what we were considering in all of this was the, how human shadows would, would interplay with the various surfaces that we were playing with. So these are some of our, our diagrams and our projections for the wall. And this is a CNC router. Uh, we be began carving uh, four by eight foot tiles. This is the largest CNC routed form that the architecture 
school has routed at WashU. I'm happy to say that was my piece. I think they wanted to murder me at the end. Um, and sometimes what happens on these machines too, that the needle that's carving can actually accidentally drag across the piece. It's just, I don't know, it goes wonky, maybe uh, fluctuation, fluctuations in the electricity. But what you see here are two you know, very good natured technicians excising uh, a one inch row that was damaged, uh, carving that same row on another piece of film and excising the damaged piece and inserting a new piece in. So this kind of CNC surgery, I call it. And this is what the surface looked like, absolutely beautiful. Um, these are stills from Dark Skies. And um, again, you'll get a better sense of it when I show you the video in a moment. But when you move to the um, to the left-hand side of the piece, you see a different video than the right side. So basically, there's two videos with two sound pieces that are uh, catching the dimensional surface at a kind of raking angle. So there is this sort of, you, when you look at it face on, you, there is this kind of lenticular effect where the image is different on the left than it is on the right on all of these different forms. This is what it looks like. And this is what I hope will work at the end here. It's a chubby file. Oh good, it's loaded. Let's take a look. So that video was um, created by the very talented Adam Hogan, one of my um, former uh, graduate students at Washington University. And it's thanks to him that we have this terrific documentation of the piece. Uh, the other collaborator on this piece is Chris Ottinger, also one of my graduate students. I'm very proud to say we graduate some terrific people. And I'll finish my, um, my lecture this evening by um, quoting um, Chris Ottinger from his statement about the uh, sound design for this work. The sound design in Dark Skies serves two functions. The first is to sonically articulate the ambiguous space between micro and macro environments, echoing those depicted in the video elements. And the second was to add an interactive and immersive quality to the work. To accomplish the first task, I studied Patricia's field recordings intently. These were field recordings that I made for the piece, um, uh, field recordings that I made at twilight uh, when I was in a residency at the Banff Center for the Arts. So these are, you know, you saw crepuscular light here. I waited for crepuscular light in real life, and then I, I, I uh, created these uh, field recordings. 
So I studied Patricia's field recordings intently, searching for small sounds that could be enlarged and large sounds that could be shrunk down. Recordings of birds and insects were of particular interest, anything that could inhabit a dark sky. These sounds were subsequently edited, sped up, slowed down, and filtered to locate hidden tones, noises, and frequencies within the source audio. The final result is a soundscape that exists somewhere between conventional sound design and a musical score. Each of the two soundtracks in Dark Skies poses their own unique characteristics. One emphasizes lower frequencies, deep rumbling sounds that are intended to shrink the listener down to the level of the microscopic. The other presents the listener with an expansive sonic landscape that morphs and flourishes of birds and industrial machinery as they transform to spooky moans in the distance. This second soundtrack can be described in terms of a micro view or zooming out from the world of the microscopic. For the interactive component of Dark Skies, the sound elements will be projected, well, are projected directionally into the exhibition space and viewers will be able to migrate between the two soundtracks, essentially moving between the micro and the macro worlds. And that is what I have to share with you this evening. Thank you.